Hello and uh, good evening. My name's Dan Plesch and I'm director of the Centre for International Studies and Diplomacy. Um, thank you for joining us on a warm sunny evening um, in London when you perhaps have got exams to mug up for or uh, spring parties to go to. Um, I did, did think of ringing up um, the Turkish government and seeing if they could shoot down another Russian aircraft, which, you know, if they'd done that sort of 24 hours ago, we might have increased the turnout. And certainly when uh, I asked uh, Andre to, uh, uh, to come and speak, uh, of course, it was at a time of uh, uh, a very new turn in uh, recent history with... Uh, uh, Russia as a military player in the Middle East and I think it's a, perhaps a, a test of uh, the power of international relations as a predictive dis discipline as to whether one could find um, any, uh, certainly any Western um, analysis predicting um, that uh, not only would uh, Russia uh, be involved uh, militarily um, in the Eastern Mediterranean, but that it would be uh, doing so apparently with the prior agreement of the United States, uh, dating back at least to the uh, meeting um, between uh, Secretaries uh, Lavrov and Kerry uh, in the United Nations um, last September, um, and perhaps still less as a predictive model from the West that by all accounts, uh, at this particular moment, there is a, uh, uh, a more or less ceasefire still in place in Syria after six years, uh, that more or less uh, this is seen as a, a great success for Russia or international collaboration in some ways, and at least some kind of progress on the apparently never-ending uh, fighting, uh, albeit with um, uh, continuing horrors and refugee flows. Uh, one might, if one was writing uh, an essay about the UN Security Council and the Great Powers, um, say that perhaps uh, unlikely allies locked in the Security Council can indeed occasionally act together in some crude way for the international benefit. At any rate, I think it's a, 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 a test that uh, almost all uh, international relations scholars would have, uh, uh, would have failed. Um, and yet here we are, um, notwithstanding the, the fact that only a few months before, um, uh, Russia was in the West uh, generally deemed to be a, uh, a great source of, uh, of evil um, after the annexation of Crimea and the events in Ukraine. Um, uh, and uh, that uh, this, of course, resulted in sanctions but still apply uh, from the European Union. Uh, and it was interesting, just as a listener of uh, Western radio and television, how uh, uh, the British Defence and Foreign Secretary, uh, or more or less within 24 hours, uh, went from um, uh, denouncing uh, Moscow as the, uh, almost in Reagan-esque terms, as the fount of evil in the modern world, to heralding our newfound collaboration uh, with uh, uh, President Putin in the Middle East, um, a, a piece of... Uh, uh, verbal uh, diplomatic gymnastics uh, for which he would surely get uh, a close to a 10, I think, if one was to uh, hand, be handing out awards um, in uh, uh, the Olympics for uh, uh, diplomatic um, somersaults. Um, at any rate, I think that's something of, the, of a sketch of the background as to why um, I uh, wanted to uh, ask uh, 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 Dr. Bakoff to... Um, to come and speak to us this evening. Um, of course, we're here at the uh, School of Oriental and African Studies um, at the University of London, uh, and one might say, well, this is best suited to uh, you know, a, a Slava um, School of Slavonic Studies. Uh, but then, of course, um, uh, Russia is uh, an Asian power, as well as a European one, and according to a fair number of people in the West, not even a European one, really. Um, uh, but an Asian one, although those, those of us who uh, 
um, read Tolstoy and, uh, and many others and realize that actually uh, Russia always was and is um, uh, at the heart of uh, the European construction. Um, I'm particularly delighted that we can um, bring uh, Dr. Bakoff here. Um, he comes from an organization of approximately the same size as SOA, some 7,000 students um, at Moscow's, uh, uh, Russia's premier international affairs uh, university. Um, he is editor-in-chief of uh, uh, Russia's uh, International Trends uh, Journal, uh, a member of uh, the American ISA, and of the executive board of the Russian Political Science Association, as well as being director of the Academic Educational Forum on International Relations. Um, and as a, in, in uh, English terms, as a deputy vice chancellor, or a deputy vice chancellor of the university, um, I think uh, those people who think that, uh, or have a, a fantasy or imagination that uh, all senior Russian officials must be uh, bald and 70 years old and uh, somehow related to Brezhnev um, should realize that uh, uh, in the uh, uh, case of, uh, of Dr. Bakoff, he uh, probably gives uh, a good 20 years to any of the senior management in this university. Um, so here too, I think we can see that perhaps our preconceptions are uh, not what we, uh, uh, not uh, um, uh, congruent with, uh, with facts. But then, um, one shouldn't ever allow a fact to spoil a good theory. Um, um, well, we'll see um, in a moment uh, whether facts and theory um, will, uh, will match up in, uh, in Dr. Bakoff's presentation. He's uh, uh, here to talk to us uh, on the uh, subject of uh, Russia and the West uh, towards a new understanding um, but very much uh, through the lens of uh, international relations uh, theory rather than just immediate um, current affairs um, analysis. Uh, we've had a great uh, um, time chatting over the last uh, day or two and uh, we hope that we'll have a relationship between our two universities um, going forward, um, exchange visits and exchange students. Um, and. Uh, I think it's uh, um, overdue that we had a, a stronger relationship between SOAS and Russian institutions, um, not least because as a, an American by adoption and having lived 20 years in Washington, I do get rather tired about SOAS always importing an American to tell us about the rest of the world. Um, so perhaps on this occasion, we can get a Russian to uh, talk to us about Russia uh, and Russia's relationship um, with the West. So I hope you'll uh, join me now in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Andre Bekov. Good evening. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me here. The subject of my talk is Russian-Western relations through the lens of uh, international relations theory. My talk comes in four parts. The first part will be devoted to the main conceptual disagreements between the IR scholar communities in Russia and the West, particularly in the US. The second part, I'm going to lay, out, to lay out in brief the principal assumptions of my approach to the topic. The third one will be concerned with the current power structure in Eurasia, with the security challenges and st strategy options that stem from it, both for the West and for Russia. In the same breath, I'll try to explain what Russia wants in the world, and how this aligns with what Western states want from Russia. To do it convincingly and comprehensively, I will have to address Russia-EU, Russia-China, and Russia-US relations, as well as the Russian strategy in the post-Soviet space, to include its stake on the Ukraine crisis. Finally, I shall talk synoptically about the possible future of our relations with the West, and what should be done on each of the fronts to encourage the trends leading to the lasting European peace and stability, and to undermine the tendencies leading to the overall Eurasian instability. The IR theories are countless, as you know. And one would think that in the world of science we should all seek a situation when the same object of reality is described more or less similarly 
from different theoretical angles. After all, we all look at the same thing, right? But the more theories, the more confusion in international relations theory. In IR, combining theories is a challenging and thankless task. Proponents of different paradigms, be it realism, liberalism, or constructivism, appear to live on different planets. This is not because all or some of these theories are wrong, because generally they are not. The reason is that policymakers discredit those theories by believing too much in one of them. Foreign policy theories can easily be converted into different foreign policy ideologies, and hence into different foreign policies. One should very carefully distinguish between explanatory and normative theorizing. Liberalism and realism, as theories, both work fairly well in explaining the current Russian-Western crisis. They both privilege restraint, rationality, and peace and stability. But as foreign policy ideologists, liberalism and realism and ensuing foreign policy moves are vastly incompatible. When you have them meet in real politics, await big time trouble. And this is exactly what we have been witnessing in the past two decades in Eurasia, culminating in the Ukraine crisis. The American approach to the academic study of international relations as we see it in Russia is in the main liberal and heavily charged ideologically. This has not yet reached the level of Brezhnev's politics in Soviet Russia, but that's definitely the way they're headed. The mainstream thinking in the US and frankly in the West in general is based on a particular set of presumptions. Doubt or criticism regarding this set of ideas can make you an intellectual pariah. For the sake of argument, I have formulated these seven presumptions in a provocatively simplified way. I may be wrong, but this is how we see it. Number one, the world political order which emerged after the collapse of the USSR is durable and will remain in place over a long term without fundamental changes. Number two, humankind is on its way towards a unified political model, which is the Western type of liberal democracy, even though different countries can do it at a different pace. All countries in the world, therefore, fall into two broad categories, advanced and backward. This division is not economic. It comes in a function of their ability to accept and adopt the norms of Western democracy. Number three, the process of liberal globalization is objective and progressive in nature. In the course of this process, national states give up part of their sovereignty to supranational institutions. The only exception is the United States, which remains the principal guarantor of a sustainable globalization process and should therefore not only maintain, but even increase its own sovereignty. Number four, a liberal and non-liberal states should have different rights in the international system. This is in essence a theory of moral inequality of states. The former have a right to influence domestic and foreign policies of the latter. And in certain cases, this right can be extended to a full-blown military intervention. At the same time, non-liberal states have no moral claim for armed resistance or a comparable offensive military capability. Number five, states are no longer pool balls with their essential interests inherent in them. Rather, there is a permanent struggle of domestic elites in those countries. It is not considered appropriate today to discuss the issues of national interest, national security, or national sovereignty. The subject of discussion is the, sec is the security and sovereignty of certain elites. Therefore, restriction of sovereignty can be in the interest of people living in a particular country, in case at the top of this country are the wrong elites. In this case, to delegitimize these elites and to revoke their sovereignty is considered not only acceptable, but morally justifiable, even though these elites may have been democratically elected. Number six, the USA remains the only world leader for the foreseeable future. It has the right to protect and expand liberal world order, even by force if necessary. Naturally, the US cannot execute it single-handedly. Consequently, it has allies and draws on its help. However, it is not acceptable for any other country to place restrictions on the activities of Washington related to world liberalization. And finally, number seven, after the collapse of the USSR, the character of international relations has drastically changed. Security competition has been replaced by cooperative action as part of the global liberal economic order but also against new common challenges shared by all civilized nations. It is a global and long-term uniting movement under the American leadership. So seven presumptions. Now, according to this logic, a particular US president can be criticized for exceeding the necessary measure of violence in the world arena in a particular case. But the general right of the US to use military force abroad cannot be called into question. 
or the range, rank of priority, or nature of the new common challenges which pose a threat to American leadership could be a subject of some discussion. But no one can doubt that those challenges are a shared problem, and all countries should rally to the support of America. It is not accidental that one of the favorite terms of American researchers is responsibility. Meanwhile, the question of to whom and why we should be responsible and how it correlates with the international legal notion of sovereignty is taken off the table. Ideological presumptions outlined above underlie the bulk of the theoretical constructs in the West and are rarely subjected to critical reasoning. Consider the theory of democratic peace, for example. There is a popular view that liberal democracies do not go to war with each other. Let us agree that this is the case. It is the case. But it is also possible that the true explanation behind it is not shared liberal values, but the fact that they belong to the same military alliance or alliances and project their aggressive nature on outside democratic world. Non-democratic world, sorry. In this case, the theory of democratic peace suddenly appears to be without any substance. Because de facto, what you say here is that a democratic peace theory is only val valuable theoretically when it effectively accounts for no wars between liberal democracies in the anarchical system. But once you bring the notion of the American pacifier factor, you end up having a hierarchical system in Europe and a group of East Asian US allies, and suddenly the democratic peace theory loses all its explanatory or theoretical value. Hence the greatest enthusiasm for mathematical methods in American political science and international relations, because obviously quantitative methods are only effective when they are lasting parameters of the international system. Also, the problem with the quantitative analysis in international relations analysis, um, theory and political science is that the formal modeling has a very unclear relation to moral criteria. The latter has uh, a subject nature and nothing in common with actual mathematical variables. Calculation of sustainable development indicators makes sense only in relation to a situation where developed countries ought to help the underdeveloped ones. Or the listing of countries according to their per capita gross national product is pointless without taking into account the value of consumption standards in each country. Or calculation of a country's vulnerability to terrorist threats is meaningless if a researcher thinks that the Arab Gulf monarchies are the main sponsors of terrorism and the US is their main supporter. In conclusion, one needs a convention of general moral criteria to engage in productive formal modeling. And this has to be universal across the global scholarly community and not just specific to a group of countries for good old verification and falsification reasons. Now let's turn to Russia. Firstly, almost no one in Russia considered the new political order which took shape after 1991 as fair and just. Accordingly, the new order was considered to be not suitable for Russia in the long run. It is no wonder that over time Russian researchers took a critical view on the new unipolar American-centric world and the results of the USSR collapse. And this effectively has put an end to any fruitful academic cooperation and research between American and Russian scholars, unless Russian colleagues too accept the infamous seven presumptions. And this is highly unlikely. Russian studies of international relations, by and large, at this moment in time, are divided into two main groups. The first group of authors brings to light trends which in the foreseeable future could put the USA leadership into question. The second describes and analyzes events which already confirm and attest to those tendencies. By the mid-2000s, the Russian expert community, after successfully adapting the Western scientific approach, decided to change direction. It was time to stop reselling American stories and articles and start coming up with original concepts. This coincided with growing moralism of political science in the USA. American researchers were more often than even in the 1990s interpreting the contemporary global order as an antagonism of liberalism and autocracy. In fact, this very much resembled the ostentatious USSR ideology of the Brezhnev epoch. After the invasion of Afghanistan in 1979, American political analysts criticized Soviet experts for getting stuck in the past and turning a blind eye to the negative shifts in the USSR international power position. Nowadays, it is the turn of Russian academic community to get the same sense about the American foreign policy studies. Nevertheless, I believe that opposing ideological approaches are not a precondition for a major conflict. It is merely an intervening and complicating factor. All things considered, a precondition for a major conflict between major powers lies in how offensive military capabilities of major powers correlate. Luckily, here we look much better 
which allows me to be generally optimistic about the future of Russian-Western relations. It is necessary to emphasize that the condition of the story I'm telling you is in no way dependent on either the upcoming American elections or parliamentary or presidential elections in Russia. This arises from the version of material understanding of IR, which has been espoused in three essentially complementary theoretical schools, to which I am quite sympathetic and choose to apply them synthetically. There's structural realism, the power transition theory, and a way of Marxism. These theories may seem different in the way they have been constructed, and it is generally not favored in IR to combine different theories, drawing on different explanatory logic, but in fact, these three do work together pretty well in explaining the nature of phenomena I'm interested in. So in essence, my argument centers on the power structure and power relations of what is sometimes called Eurasia. Surely it is hardly possible to forget about the current sour relationship between the peoples and nations living here, as well as about the mutual distrust, suspicion, and even fear, irresponsibly exploited or genuinely felt by the ruling elites of these countries. But this can be instrumental only in explaining the tactical and short-term variations of those relations, but not in accounting for their fundamental logic. In my version of events, the domestic political circumstances of any of these countries involved do not play any significant role in changing the course of the global and European politics. In the long run, nor will this relationship be in any meaningful way affected by the ways the current Ukrainian crisis is going to evolve. Strategically and over the long term, the future of Russian-Western relations will continue to be largely shaped by the basic distribution of material power in the world, but notably in Eurasia, just like it had been the case all the way up until the Ukraine crisis. Having said that, I do acknowledge the importance of the ideological preferences of the population expressed in their geopolitical attitudes towards each other. This highlights the importance of such aspects as trust and satisfaction with the existing rules and institutions versus suspicion and dissatisfaction, or friendship and economic and security dependence versus enmity and economic and security non-dependence. While the foreign policy outcomes are determined by the basic power structure, to understand the nature of distrust or enmity, one need a different paradigm. So here so neatly comes Marxism, which basically claims that ideological in incompatibility between states can be explained by the incompatibility of their respective socioeconomic structures of their societies. But let's for now return to the structural explanation at the systemic level. The regional and international architecture of interstate relations in Eurasia took shape more or less definitively in the mid-2000s with the EU enlargement idea coming to the fore as starting to define the rationale of the Union as never before in its history, with the rise of China becoming a troubling reality for its neighbors, and with Russia's return to history as a major European power, territorially large, sufficiently populated, heavily armed, but technologically and economically inferior, a big bad gorilla, as John Mearsheimer famously put it. The previous time Russia was a major European power was the concert of Europe in the 19th century the classical age of multipolarity and the first episode of globalization. We all remember the tragic result of that classical multipolarity. The resemblance may indeed be striking. The principal nation states in Europe now and then seem to be roughly in balance, precisely as it was the case on the eve of the Great War. One of the actors is seemingly dissatisfied with the system, and this is Russia. Now the question is, if it is going to challenge the dominant power and upset the balance by starting a major war, as the theory would predict. The structural resemblance may be striking, but it is misleading. The dominant country at that time was the United Kingdom. Germany was indeed able to claim regional hegemony and was clearly dissatisfied. It did therefore make perfect strategic sense for Germany to challenge the dominant power. It is always more costly to dislodge the incumbent power than to stay in power, but the dynamics of Germany's economy and demography did not make it impossible. Also, the great powers in Europe on the eve of the First World War were operating in the anarchical system. There was, of course, a hierarchy of potentials with Britain sitting at the top, but it was anarchical in the sense that there was no higher sovereign in the regional system to pacify it. In that situation, a war was a possibility. Both structural realism and the power transition agreed that the preconditions of a major conflict were in place. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the power structure in Europe has been entirely different, facilitating peace rather than conflict. First, the power situation is bipolar to date, in exactly the same way as it was during the Cold War. One of the poles is still Russia, 
with its enormous offensive military capabilities vis-a-vis -vis any other European nation state. The bulk of its 145 million population concentrated along its western borders and with its strategic independence. Here I would like to narrow down for practical purposes my definition of a great power. In my story, a great power is a country which is not dependent on any other state or a coalition of states to provide for its own security. The other pole is obviously the US, maintaining a major military presence in Europe. But there is another difference. It is the major institutional character of the security environment in Europe, mainly two institutional parameters, NATO and the EU. These are two macro coalitions of satisfied states supporting the global dominant power, the US. There is no way you take the US out of equation and therefore out of the European picture and balance of power. If you do, you assume that the factor of NATO is not essential to it. The latter presumption was entirely plausible in the event of the diminishing of the Russian power in Europe, as it had been declining up until the early 2000s. The increase in the significance of the Russian factor has made the evacuation of the American troops for Europe highly unlikely, even in the face of the Chinese challenge. Indeed, the relative strengthening of Russia uh, in the early 2000s and before that put the European security uh, in the face of an important dilemma. One of them was the waning of the American interest in Europe and its pivot to Asia. This would have demanded from Europe to build up its independent military capability, and the EU was experiencing quite a lot of difficulties with that. But the Russian fact that the Russian economic boom in the 2000s, together with a more assertive stance on the world stage resulting in the Ukraine crisis, convinced the US that pulling out of Europe was not an option. Under this scenario, the EU is unlikely to become strategically independent anytime soon, but at least the possibility of war from a structural perspective in Europe is zero. So we still have a situation in which we have hierarchical uh, concert of European powers in the West and the US military involvement serving as an important stabilizing factor, alleviating, uh, alleviating what could have been the intense security competition inside the EU, but also between Russia and the EU. But this does not make the situation any easier, because we still have a major crisis in Europe, and that is the Ukraine crisis, very little cooperation on the continent, and very bleak prospects for the near future. Now here I would consider three major factors. Russia's new role in Europe and Eurasia after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the future of the EU and the US global strategy. The message I'm going to get across here is straightforward. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia stopped being a Eurasian power whose wealth, population, and strategic interests had lay both in Europe and in Asia and emerged once again as a fundamental European power, both in terms of its demography, economy, and general culture, if not domestic politics. A new European Russia, along with other states that appeared on its western borders, were bound to join the EU. The reason was no other conceivable way of putting behind the previous power structure and intense security competition which came with it. But the problem is that the enlargement policy of the EU has excluded this possibility altogether. That means living out of the EU such countries as Moldova, Ukraine and Belarus. The resulting division of Europe will be ideologically antagonizing for both sides and not politically and strategically viable, as it will establish a disequilibrium of forces with a dissatisfied Russia to one side of the border and dissatisfied middle countries like Belarus, Moldova and Ukraine in between them. The reason why these countries are never joining the EU in this kind of strategic setting is because Russia will never let them. Furthermore, the scenario will leave us with a dissatisfied Europe for not being able to consolidate the process of the European unification on which it embarked in the 1990s and of which the break of the USSR and the Yugoslavia were all logical steps. Given the present economic and demographic trends, it is indeed clear that Russia is not going now or in any foreseeable future to increase its strategic visibility and presence anywhere in Latin America or Asia Pacific apart from Europe. Russia is therefore not a global dissatisfied power, as many people think. Given the rate of its economic growth even in the 2000s, which was 6% a year, it can only dream of increasing its share in the global GDP up to 5% maximum. Russia could, of course, join China in a coalition of the uh, global dissatisfied, but China, in essence, is a satisfied power, at least for the near future. 
China conforms to the rules and Russia, in light of its actual economy and place in the international division of labor, has no other way but to conform to the rules too, which it has been effectively doing since the 1990s. But it is a dissatisfied regional power, as it finds itself outside of the group which de facto and de jure determines the policies of the European continent, which affect Russia directly. And Russia, on the other hand, can do little, if anything at all, to influence those policies. There is actually a strong moral and normative case for Russia's inclusion in the EU and NATO, because the current structure is in sharp contradiction with the fundamental liberal and democratic principles on which the EU rests. This is the principle of affected interest. This principle, coming from the uh, democracy theory, implies that power should be accountable to those it affects. In the scenario I'm trying to uh, present here, Russia, as well as other CIS countries, are heavily affected by the power of the EU in terms of the regulations, but not only them. But the prospects of Russian citizens or the citizens of Belarus, for example, to influence the way the decisions are made in Brussels is virtually non-existent. Such a structure of Europe, divided ideologically, but also militarily and politically, is not sustainable over the long term. This will either lead to the end of the European project in the vicinity of the next 15, 20 years, which I consider more likely to happen, or to the inclusion of all those countries into the EU and NATO, starting with Russia, and then followed by Ukraine, Georgia, Belarus, and Moldova. But this will completely change the balance of power within Europe. It will change Europe beyond recognition. It will make the US military involvement with Europe permanent, NATO less relevant. It will also make China less formidable as a potential challenger in the global power and wealth distribution. Now, the reason why this is the only way to go is because Russia seeks recognition. Recognition for the status it de facto has, one of the strongest powers in Europe whose place and destiny are with Europe. Once this recognition is granted, no more struggle will be necessary, and the tension will be largely over. Russia also needs accommodation with Europe for practical reasons, which in fact have a lot to do with European strategic interests, because this is the only way it can address its internal problems, assure steady growth, and last but not least, provide for regional security in the smaller Eurasia, that is Eurasian Economic Union and the neighboring countries. The current challenges with this union result from the weakness of Russia, both economic and strategic. But this weakness also entails more regional instability in Eurasia. The turning of Russia into global and recognized state will change dynamics in the Eurasian Union, making it more pragmatic and more efficient. Right now, what we have is de facto smaller countries manipulating Russia, taking advantage of it, for their own benefit, knowing that being internationally isolated, Moscow needs these countries as its only allies. Now I'd like to point out the problems that are in the way of Russian-US rapprochement. First is Ukraine. It is clear that the Minsk agreements as the basis for the settlement are no longer operational. Paradoxically, the only side that wants them implemented is Moscow. Kiev, it seems to me, is intent on building a mono-ethnic consolidated Ukraine for which the sizable Russian-speaking minority of Ukrainians and Russians alike is a huge obstacle on this way. They definitely don't consider them as part of their society. If the opposite were true, it is hard to imagine that they would have used the same brutal tactics of fighting the so-called terrorists, which were de facto the Ukraine, Ukraine citizens, as they did in the spring and summer of 2014. Consider that Russia has already accepted over one million refugees from Ukraine since the beginning of the conflict. The number of those who fled to the central and western Ukraine pales in comparison. The only thing it shows is that Ukraine was and remains a deeply divided nation, for which the prospect of unification is a serious problem, but not an impossible one to resolve. On the other hand, the self-proclaimed republics over which Russia, in fact, exerts very little influence, are too disorganized and divided to be able to come up with a common position and then stick to it. And given the Kiev's policy, I would not be surprised if the only two options they actually consider is independence or joining Russia. One can hardly blame them for that in these circumstances, but what can be done? Well, for me, lifting sanctions is an indis indispensable first step. Number two would be putting pressure on Ukraine from both sides to reintegrate the east of Ukraine. Number three, the West should undertake to reconstruct the West and central Ukraine and Russia, the east of Ukraine, under full control of international financial institutions. Problem number two, China. Despite Russia's apparent effort to pivot to Asia, this turn will be effectively limited to China alone, and therefore deserves Russian security interests. An alliance with China will ultimately make Russia strategically dependent on China and its massive economy, which is the last thing Russia can think of. 
It may improve somewhat its ties with other Asia-Pacific states, but due to the enormous influence the U.S. enjoys there and the premium the U.S. places on containing China, Russia risks endangering its relative power position in the region even more. Russia, on the contrary, seeks accommodation with Europe. It is ready for it, but in the meantime, it is trying to improve on its relative power position vis-a-vis -vis Europe by aligning with China. Does Russia want an alliance with China? This question is irrelevant, because even if it does, the trouble is China is not interested. In the long run, should China rise to the regional and therefore global hegemony, a Russian-Chinese alliance will be at best a pale version of a US-British or more pertinently a US-Canada alliance, with a major difference lying in the cultural chasm between Russia and China, which makes such an alliance over the long term hardly viable. My argument is that Russia will be neutral to US-China growing tensions and will effectively have the same stance as Europe on this matter. So the US may in fact want the Russian-China alliance because A, it may strategically weaken it, and B, it will prevent Russia from siding with Europe on the China issue. Now, the third problem is the persistent misconceptions about Russia in the EU. The first one has to do with the Eurasian integration policies and allegedly negative attitudes towards NATO, and the EU eastward expansion. One has to start by saying that NATO and EU expansion was not particularly conducive to the European security in the first place, because as I said before, it did not envisage Russian joining, joining it. One has to be clear, Russia has never feared a direct military threat from NATO. All it was worried about was the lessening of the space of independent action in the region. After all, having no country over which to project influence is a nightmare for any great power. There is no other way to make great power nervous than to take away all its allies in the neighborhood. Another big controversy with regard to Russian foreign policy is the Eurasian integration project. There is a strong-headed argument that, most, that Russia is trying to recreate the Soviet empire. My answer to those claims would be a look at the map. None of the countries involved in the scheme has any viable alternative to maintaining their current economic performance, let alone improving it, other than through close integration with Russia. This integration is in their vital interest, not ours. Let's consider each country in turn. Belarus. Belarus is a one-man overtly authoritarian country. It is viable, self-sustaining, but lacks the market and resources to feed its economy. In the Soviet times, it used to be an assembly conveyor for the country's industry. Now it is continuing on the same track. Belarus would like to flirt with the EU, but getting into EU as a member is not an option due to the political regime, which is highly unlikely to change anytime soon. With this in mind, Russia is the only Belarusian friend and ally. Armenia and Azerbaijan are bogged deeply down in a territorial dispute, and neither of them is willing to compromise. Moscow has repeatedly tried to resolve this conflict, but the issue means a great deal to both parties. Moscow is a de facto peace guarantor in the region, with no real leverage to its credit to bring the conflict to an end. Moscow leaving the region, however, means an inevitable war there. Armenia is blocked by Azerbaijan and Turkey, so Russia is its only ally and trading partner. The Central Asian Republics is an easy case. The, Euro the Eurasian integration for them is a way of soft balancing against China, which is de facto dominating their national econo economies already. The West has to understand that by discouraging a pro-Russian orientation in all of these countries, the West and the EU in particular are endangering big time their prospects for survival. And they're not offering them anything in return. But that will mean mayhem in Eurasia, especially in the Caucasus and in Central Asia. On the other hand, Russia's policy in the region is not strategically sound either. It does everything it can to show the importance of these countries to Russia. The countries get the message just right. There are increasing signs of smaller countries taking advantage of their strategic significance for Russia, notably Belarus, pressing for concessions, preferences, and material benefits, something Russia should and will put an end to in the end. Russia is a de facto regional hegemon with a very small prospect of being threatened in its immediate neighborhood. The security of Russia is assured. The only reason why it is so busy with Eurasian economic integration is struggling for regional and global recognition. Accommodation with Europe will solve this problem and will make the integration in Eurasia more economically viable and sensible. The second misconception concerns the historical parameters of the Russian state. Both Russia and the West accuse each other of being on the wrong side of history. Well, Russia does it because it believes that the West hurries too much in bringing everyone the light of freedom. The West, in its turn, looks at Russia as an empire in the process of further disintegration and decline. This is a fundamental point. From this perspective, in the eyes of the West, it would be A, logical for Russia to expand, 
because that is what empires do, and B, it would only be right for the West to help Russia disintegrate, come to the normal condition. Well, regarding A, interestingly, before Ukraine, there was no evidence whatsoever that Russia was on the march to grab other countries' territories. It only happened when Ukraine was about to join NATO and the EU. On the contrary, during the 90s and 2000s, Russia was the main country which was advocating the territorial integrity of the former Soviet republics and was given the mandate by the Security Council in the 1990s to settle the conflicts that erupted following the collapse of the Soviet Union. Regarding B, it is clear to anyone knowing anything about the ethnic and demographic composition of Russia that it is already a nation state, with the Russians accounting for over 80% of the population and dominating numerically in all so-called national autonomous republics inside Russia, except for Chechnya, where this also was the case, but then all Russians had to flee because of the onset of the hostilities. Finally, about authoritarianism in Russia, which is another obstacle to its European choice and integration. Russia was primed for democracy in the late 1980s. The democratic revolution was done by the people who took to the streets. The elites didn't change entirely, it is true, but they did respond to the voices of the population. The way, the way democracy turned out in reality was the plundering and wrecking of the country, but even this didn't change the course of the country. It was the separation tendencies, the growing criminalization of the economy, which in fact threatened the unity of the country. What the West calls the resurgence of authoritarian tendencies, I would call the transformation of Russia into national security state, which was inevitable in the face of the combination of internal and external threats. This is what has been happening in Russia since the late 1990s, a tendency a majority of Russia still resent, but covertly thank the providence that the security situation at home changed for the better. I am convinced that a pro-European choice Russia will be provided with can be very instrumental in alleviating the sense of insecurity in the population, which is the primary cause of the strong state ideology prevalent in Russia at the moment. In conclusion, Russia is a declining great power with an improving statecraft, state-of-the-art army, largely pro-Western, pro-European population. It seeks to stabilize its neighborhood and has a strategic interest in aligning with Europe. What should the European policy be like in those circumstances? I think they should help Russia to come to Europe. Today's Europe has no strategy for Russia. The one it seems to pursue will lead the EU itself to a disaster. It is time for the EU to come up with a sound strategy, the one that is going to bring lasting peace and stability to this continent. Thank you very much. Um, rather than uh, staying, so I had its own equivalent of the, uh, the Soviet era reviewing stand up here, uh, I suggest we could come down and just talk a bit more okay. informally with people um, and uh, take your questions as you were on the program at the head of country. Hi, my name's uh, Sebastian. I'm working with Dan in the department. Um, you talked about what Europe should be doing for Russia, uh, and I, I'm just curious, uh, are there any feelings within Russia that Russia would like to integrate closer with the EU, or is that uh, more of an ideal scenario than we've discussed? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, the feelings about the integration into Europe are very strong, actually. Yes, uh, the moment sanctions are lifted, everyone will run back into it. European economic space and uh, back to cooperation, it's uh, pretty obvious. The Russian population is largely pro-European. If you even look at the um, pattern of the population distribution, you'll see that beyond, uh, in the Far East it's only 6 million people out of 146, right? So uh, it's over 80% which is in the European part of the of the country, so uh, the, inf the influence of this kind of uh, the segment of the population is, uh, is enormous, and it would determine the policy rather than anything else, or any strategic or other considerations. Thank you. Do you want to have any questions? Yes, please. Um, is it, is it one second? Sorry. The invasion of uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, in uh, um, Afghanistan in, seven, in 1979, you did mention that issue. How much do you think the invasion of the Soviet Union in uh, Afghanistan 
contributed to uh, the situation in the Middle East, or especially uh, those uh, uh, whatever splinter groups of religious, uh, religious uh, Islamic religion. Um, I would say uh, the uh, Soviet Union has created uh, the uh, situation in the Middle East now. What do you say that? Well, to begin with, I'm not an expert on the Middle Eastern affairs, so it's, it's, I really don't want to get something wrong here. Uh, right. Um, but I wouldn't say, go as far as you did in saying that it, is, it was the primary Soviet responsibility for the current situation. What we know is that the um, Soviet intervention in Afghanistan actually helped consolidation of the Afghan factions of the society in the face of the common threat which was presented by the Soviet um, invasion. But it is clear and there is no question that the whole uh, operation was very badly calculated and well you know the onset of the intervention, the beginning of it was uh, rather a shameful page uh, of Russian military history so I, I wouldn't uh, argue with you that that was not the greatest page in our history but I wouldn't go as far as to say that the responsibility for the current situation lies with the Soviet intervention. If I just add, uh, if you go, if you, sorry, not for you, but for the recording, um, if you go around the archives of some of the major Western institutions and think tanks, Chatham House particularly, place I used to work, the Royal United Services Institute, you will find that they held uh, grand celebrations of the 200th anniversary of Wahhabism in 1989 because US foreign policy chose to combat the Soviet Union by uh, a major investment um, in Wahhabism um, and those forces. And I dangle this out every year and I've yet to find one, uh, it's a bit late in the day now, but a student to do a dissertation uh, looking at um, uh, the Western celebrations of, of the 200th anniversary uh, of Wahhabism in the context of the Afghan war. Um, I'm still looking for takers. Thank you. Uh, there was, uh, where are we? Yeah, please, can I get that? We've got quite a few, so we've got Hi, my name's Beth. Um, I was wondering about Russia's recent success with Eurovision, because, <laughs> because Moscow is very cosmopolitan. The rest of Russia doesn't seem to be once you get past Perm or Ekaterinburg. It's just not quite so European. And if Russia's going to get very involved with Eurovision, which is quite a gay um, contest, frankly, is that going to cause a massive clash in Russian society? No. Well, <laughs> it's an interesting question. I was completely unprepared for it. Um, well, actually, I think it's Russia. Very diverse yeah, yeah, yeah. Discussions I think Russia lost uh, its interest in Eurovision contest <laughs> when uh, we won one of them. <laughs> <laughs> because for Russia, it's very important to win and to stick our nose and everything. And once we are there, then we lose interest. And actually, the popular feelings about the contest is not as um, vibrant as it was before the first victory. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your interest. Well, I think we've had a Eurovision context question before in this auditorium, so congratulations. Uh, please. Uh, yes, I'm speaking as somebody who indirectly has quite good relations with Russia, since my wife got a job in connection with the Skolk of a business school and is still uh, doing little jobs for them, mainly from London. But it, I had a few good visits to Moscow, so I got a very good feel for them, remarkably wonderful civilization. Thank you. It's a very pro-Russian, that's not that. But I think you're too kind to Western politics because from where I'm standing, I think you think that everybody agrees with the Washington foreign policy elite, but in fact there are big political changes taking place in Europe in attitudes. And even in the US, that elite is being challenged, that elite in, in the shape of Hillary Clinton is being challenged both from the left and from what we might call the centre-right. 
and Donald Trump is being very much discounted in this country by the sort of liberal press, but I can see what his appeal is, and I sometimes at talks and discussions defend his position. Did you want to put a question? Um, yeah, my question is, that. my question is that um, about the use, I think, what do you think about this? Do you think that the West is going to stop using, and I'm going to use a very crude expression here, as you said before, the celebration of Wahhabism, to put it more crudely, since 1953, the West has been using Islamist groups as attack dogs uh, for, for foreign policy objectives by pumping yeah, money into them. Yeah. So do you think that this, there's going to be a winding down and, you, and are, do you think that political changes in Europe and the US are going to affect foreign policy in the medium term? Well, I don't really think that because as I was trying uh, to say, maybe not very clearly in, in my talk, that from my theoretical perspective, it is not what elites are in power in a particular country, but how power is distributed. Uh, in the international system. And from this point of view, I was looking mostly at Eurasia and Europe because I um, put Russia as a European country, not as a Eurasian country, which the USSR was as the Asian country, for that matter. There is little threat, if anything, but rather there much more compatibility and uh, the way for Russia to fit into the European system rather than staying outside of it. But regarding the, your question on, it, uh, on it, milit militant, Islamic militant groups, well, I think here Russia and the US now are sharing a common security interest. And I don't think that this is actually a very plausible threat. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, presenting your ideas. Uh, I'm Bhavna Dave. I'm the person who works on Russia, Central Asia here. I have a couple of questions. Uh, first one, you did respond to the earlier question uh, about, you know, what are Russia's arguments for seeking integration with Europe, for becoming part of Europe. But you just mentioned that in a very sparse way. I'd like to understand more discussion of that because uh, you know what are the reasons prime motivations you know how does russia justify itself being primarily european you know i mean looking at debates in russia i know the main reasons are civilizational cultural you know the need to identify primar primarily with with europe uh, but overall russia's history the debates there's a lot of ambiguity about where Russia belongs between Europe and Asia, Eurasia. There are many Russian analysts and others all through last 20 years have been redefining Russia in various ways. I mean, you know, the, this description of Russia is Euro-Pacific, Asia-Pacific, Eurasian, uh, neither Europe nor Asia, you know. So, so there are multiplicity of views and there's no agreement uh, on, on this. And that is also one uh, key factor. So, so I wanted your view on, uh, you know, a bit more in depth. And second, also, and it's connected to this point, uh, I think I heard you mention uh, that Russia is a nation state. Is that correct? 80% uh, of people are Russian. Could you use an equivalent term in Russian language which says that Russia is a nation state? There is no such term. There is no there's notion of gasudastvinas, there's no nation, uh, notion of nationalness or nazia or nationalism. So it's very hard to even capture the idea of Russia being a nation state in Russian language itself. So again, it's, I think it's a very ambiguous, uh, open-ended, unsettled kind of identity about what Russia is and what is Russianness. Uh, so, you know, Far East and Siberia, two thirds of Russia's territories are in Far East and Siberia, but these are also territories not really well integrated into Russia and the mainstream kind of Russian identity and culture. So, I think I'll stop with that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Regarding your first questions on uh, where Russia belongs, uh, Europe or Asia. I don't actually see any arguments 
against the position Russia is not part of Europe. Because territorially, it is definitely in Europe. If you take Russia out of Europe, even at the level of abstract thinking, then you don't have any other region to place it. Because economically, linguistically, culturally, and historically, it's been very involved with European affairs. But this is not the major problem. My analysis was structural. I was envisaging, envisaging a situation when the European Union, based on the idea of expansion and consolidating the European identity, is inevitably going to face the problem what to do with the countries that are now to the east of its borders. And these countries are Moldova, Belarus, and Ukraine. It can say that since you're closer to Russia and you're in the sphere of influence of Russia, we're not going to, to bring you in. But this is not that the EU is going to say to those countries, because this, is this runs a counter to the constructivist idea of the European project as it is. So they're going to tackle this problem one way or another. The problem of uh, the EU is going to tackle this problem. The problem uh, which uh, became obvious with Ukraine was that the EU wasn't thinking about it in these terms. And Russia showed clearly that it was not going to let it happen, that Ukraine was beco becoming part of Europe. But they already promised this to uh, Ukraine. The same problem lies with Belarus. Belarus is, if there can be debate with Russia, I can agree with that, but there is no debate that Belarus is not a U European country. It is fundamentally a European country in terms of its history, in terms of its population. It is very easy for the EU to absorb, much easier than other countries. The only problem with it is the political system. But well, this political system is temporary, right? It's not going to be there for centuries. So one way or another, the problem will be what we, should, what we do with Belarus, what we do with Moldova, what we do with Ukraine. In that case, you either bring them in with Russia or you leave them outside. But leaving them outside creates a greater structural disbalance in Europe than bringing them in with all the uh, reservations that are implicit in that in terms of how it changes the balance of power in Europe that Russia may want to dominate, even though it's not going to dominate Europe if it's become part of the EU because it's big territorial, it was economically, it's not uh, preponderant in the, in the EU. It's definitely not an Asian country. It used to be an Asian country. When you look at the uh, Soviet policies, yes, it, it has strategic interests in Asia. It had a system of allies in Asia. It was balancing uh, the US in Asia. A lot of, of its population was in Asia because, as you know, the population was ascribed to uh, registered. Uh, right now, the internal integration, uh, the internal migration from, uh, the, uh, from Far East and Siberia to Europe is so enormous. There's, prob there's basically no one living there, comparatively, if you uh, contrast it with the situation in Europe. So if uh, I'm given uh, two options, what is uh, Russia, Europe, or Asia, even though there can be a debate uh, about this, it's definitely not Asia, so probably it's Europe, or I don't know what else. It's not in Eurasia either. Uh, the second question with the nation state. There is in Russian a term, Gosudarstvanatsya, Politicheskaya Natsya. The Institute of uh, Ethnography, uh, headed by Akademician Tishkov, was producing a scholarship on this theme starting from the early 1990s. And this is a well-established uh, school of thought in Russia at the moment. I teach a course on ethnic uh, process in Russia, and we discuss it in great, uh, uh, at great length with students um, regarding how people are integrated in Siberia and Far East. Well, political nation is not an ethnic nation, but there are very few ethnic nations at this um, point in history owning their own state. And the uh, obvious example is um, the USA. If you look at the spectrum, where on one hand you have a nation state, on the other hand you have empire, the US obviously not an empire. Russia is not an empire either, because people who are ethnically different are very much politically integrated and social and cultural integration integrated in the, in the Russian uh, identity. And the best illustration of that is the role of the Russian language. As you know, the distance from Vladivostok to Kaliningrad is greater than from Moscow to Johannesburg. But if you, look a person, if you uh, listen to a person speaking in Russian in Vladivostok and Kaliningrad, they'll speak exactly the same language with no regional variation, lexical variation, or phonetical variation. So this is, I think, one of the best illustrations showing how 
integrated actually politically and culturally the country is much more than any other uh, country of this kind of diverse ethnic diversity. Yes. Nation state and multi ethnic federation, these are not the same. So, Russia is a multi, if it's defined as a multi national no, federation. So, you don't have, you know, a multinational federation also calling itself nation state. I mean, there are contradictions. No, the question is why it is called a federation. It, it became a federation because Bolsheviks made, turned it into a federation, not because it was a federation before that. It was their political decision. Was it a federation in the Soviet times? No, it was a perfectly unitary state, called call the federation at the... Uh, Pardon? During the Soviet times, Russian Soviet Federation. Oh, but this is just the name. Well, but, <laughs> but <you know. laughs> anyway, we can talk. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, one of the things you didn't mention was the possible and potential divergences between Europe and the United States. I'm particularly thinking in terms of the complexities of the geopolitics of oil. Uh, uh, as, as we know, the price of oil is falling and it's very volatile at present, and this has an impact obviously on Russia, uh, but also have an impact on the Middle East with the, with the possibility of collapsing states. So what would you see that, what kind of scenarios can you foresee in terms of Eurasian politics um, particularly as one, at least one country could collapse. I mean, I don't think Iran is going to collapse. It's the second oldest country in the world. I don't think that's going to collapse, but several other countries might um, if, if the price of oil falls below a certain level. Um, and the other thing is, could you, could you comment on the theories of uh, Alexander Dugin, who I believe is quite influential in such matters? Well, I'll start with the, with the second question because it, it is uh, easier. I'm not familiar actually, with his theories, and I work in the major institution, <laughs> which uh, proves that his theories are not really that influential. I know, well, I obviously know him, I know him personally, but I've, I haven't ever read him, and when, this is not taught uh, at the university. Uh, regarding uh, the first question, I'm not sure I uh, got it right. Uh, um, the idea was that uh, with the uh, European and American positions diverging, how this is going to affect the Eurasian, the Eurasian policies, right? Well, I think this is a very important question because, again, as I was more focusing on how Russia would fit into the European uh, region and the uh, power structure, the US is obviously a very important factor, and the way it is going to play out is directly dependent on the on the US, at, U.S. attitude to that, in a way. And uh, I think the only way it's going to happen, the way I was kind of trying to present it, is that uh, the EU becomes more aware of its strategic interest in terms of their security in the future and how to make it more stable and to uh, smooth out the security dilemma which now exists in Europe uh, overtly or covertly, now more overtly than, than before. Vis-à-vis uh, -vis Russia, but as, uh, as uh, with regard to Russia in the Middle East, I'm absolutely convinced that Russia is, go, is, is sharing the same security interest as the EU and um, the US with regard to the major threat from the um, disequilibrium, disequilibrium in um, in the Middle East. Therefore, Russia's support for Iran, because it is a very important factor in not upsetting the general balance of power and general security setting in the region. So I think we can take one more question after which I hope you will uh, uh, join us upstairs for a drink uh, at our reception in the Brunei Suite just above here where we can continue the discussion uh, more informally. Uh, go in there. Добрый вечер. Здравствуйте. So I've heard, uh, oh yeah, my name is Anna, and I'm studying international relations at the LSE. And uh, I'm, I've heard a lot of people describe the Russia-West relations in terms of uh, Samuel Huntington's famous clash of civilizations and saying this is a clash of Western civilization against Slavic Orthodox civilization. So do you think this is an appropriate framework to describe uh, relations between Russia and West right now? 
Do you mean to say that in LSC you're being taught that Russian Western relation? No, no, not in the LSC, no. <laughs> okay. No, I don't really uh, believe this theory because it is not um, proven empirically, I think. Some people say that this is actually proof that, you know, this is. This is this exists. This uh, right. Well, it runs counter to the theory I subscribe to, which is the power structure predominance. <laughs> I, I might just uh, I, well, we will break now, um, but I would just add um, if you go and look at the Western strategic mm -hmm. literature of the 1970s and um, political science literature, you will find a very strong North American argument that all countries of a Catholic population were irredeemably authoritarian. And this explained the dictatorships of Latin America, um, Spain and Portugal. Um, one might say a somewhat self-serving uh, analysis. Anyway, um, with that slight uh, uh, diversion, will you join me in thanking uh, Andre and then come and have a drink? Thank you very much.